I've come down to Carl's beautiful yard. Thank you for joining us, Carl, for the BD at home feature. Um, you were very bravely said we could throw some questions out to members, which we, we did. And um, we got a very warm response and some great questions. We had two marriage proposals. <laughs> a few please could I have a lesson? A call to never retire. That was from me. And lots of use of the word legend, hero, and superstar. So clearly you are adored. So we're going to start at the beginning. Simple question. What age did you start dressage at? Well, I'm from the Channel Islands. I'm from Sark, as everyone will know. That's not an island uh, that was for riding. That was an island for working horses, carriage horses. So um, I did my bareback riding there on the carriage horses, but I first came to uh, the UK when I was um, 15, and I started doing dressage straight away because I came here to do my AI so that encompassed everything of course you had to do flat work jumping and a bit of cross country so I suppose that was my first dip uh, into dressage then and um, a, a year or two years after that then I won the national young rider dressage championships I had no idea what I was doing I was on a nice colored lovely colored mare called Jolly Dolly um, and she was an event horse and I went to Goodwood not expecting anything um, I didn't even know where I was going. I mean, I'd never been to Goodwood or heard of Goodwood, and um, the people that I worked for took me there, and I was, yeah, I won my first championship there. I thought, this is great fun, I can do this, um, and that's where my love for it first started. And somebody's asked, um, where does your motivation come from? And obviously, sort of having been doing this for a number of years, how do you stay motivated? Um, well, my motivation w w comes from like working with other people, really. I mean, you know, I feel sorry for all those people out there that have to do this on their own because it's, that's when it's difficult to stay motivated. I mean, we can all be motivated because we love and ride horses, um, but actually to be in sport and keep up with sport uh, and be motivated, I always think you need to, uh, you know, have somebody to bounce off. And of course, the person that uh, uh, bounces off me and I bounce off them, of course, is Charlotte, because we work together every day. So it's really finding someone to, uh, to help you with the motivation rather than thinking there must be some magical cure to it. <laughs> and what would be your sort of greatest tip to give to somebody looking to succeed in our sport? Well, I think, you know, you become a horse person when you, when you learn to start training horses. I mean, if you're lucky enough to um, be able to ride a schoolmaster, so it gives you the feel, it gives you the idea of what dressage is all about. Um, and that can be very exciting, especially when you do your first PF or your first passage or, you know, it is a, it's a wonderful feeling um, to be able to get an opportunity to do that. But of course, I think the horsemanship part comes in from training your own horses um, and you know the more you train the more you're going to succeed and, and training can be anything it can be a pony it can be a cob it can be a thoroughbred it can be an ex racehorse we know that you know more and more now that um, you know our members of British dressage are riding all those sorts of horses and from what I see when I'm out there watching um, they're doing a good job and they will be learning just by training whatever comes their way uh, hopefully for the day that they find their superstar that might take them all the way to Grand Prix who knows um, and somebody who sort of said she wrote in and said she really suffers with her her nerves when she gets to a competition what how do you stay calm um, that's of course depends on somebody's personality now when I went to work for Dr. B's I was under huge pressure um, but I loved competing and um, or I thought I loved competing until I did my first competition on uh, you know his amazing horses that had, had a huge success already before I was there um, and I just got some help to actually get someone to help me stop thinking about the competitions. Uh, and that works for me. So, you know, when I go to a show, I surround myself by people that stop me thinking about the competition that I can talk to. Some people love to be on their own. Uh, I don't. I like to be with lots of other people so that I can keep talking, keep chatting, stop, you know, like thinking that this is the, uh, this is going to be the end just because it's a competition. And probably like all riders, um, I think when you get on your horse, you feel a lot better than when you're off your horse. So keep talking until you get on and then when you get on you should be all right i mean you've got to learn to be all right you've got to learn of course to be prepared don't go out and try and compete at a level that you're only working at at home i mean go out at a level below so you feel comfortable and confident and your horse knows what it's doing you know what you're doing and then you know when you move to the next level up then you know you obviously step up in competition uh this is a good one what's your favorite dressage movement and why oh 
I mean, I love flying changes, I have to say. It's something um, that I've always enjoyed teaching horses. Um, you know, they come in all shapes and sizes and I feel that, you know, I feel that with flying changes there's always a way to get nearly every type of horse, as long as it hasn't got a, a fundamentally bad canter, uh, in other words it has a wrong rhythm, but as long as they have a decent rhythm, whether it be a small canter or a big canter, I think the flying changes are the most fun to teach. And actually it's, it's probably what I spend most of my life doing, helping people to teach changes because a lot of people find them difficult and I find them great fun. So. Um, yeah, it would be fine changes. That sort of leads quite nicely into our um, sec the question afterwards, which is, looks like I've planned it, but I haven't, honestly. What is your top tip for a great canter, and does it depend on the rider's seat? Um, well, a, a, a great canter is one that has a high moment of suspension. So if you look at um, back and you think of some of the videos you'll have seen of Allegro or Utopia cantering, those horses had great canters, and I specifically pick those horses because I love their canters. So. The, the, the great canter itself had a big moment of suspension. Both of the horses looked like they were going uphill. Um, they turned out to be great in the end. Of course, if you have a horse with a big canter, you have to teach it to collect to do all of these movements. Uh, and that definitely does come from the rider's seat. I mean, everything comes from the rider's seat. I mean, how we sit on a horse is how you influence it. So you do have to, um, that is something that you will work on. You know, your seat has to follow the horse in canter. Uh, and I was always told, you know, in canter you have to let your hips move through your hands. Uh, that's a great way of thinking about it because then you swing forward with the horse when it canters. Um, and I think that the canter, of course, has all the movements in that are most difficult for Grand Prix. So if you, get, if you want to do Grand Prix, try and make sure you pick a horse with a very good 3B uphill canter because there's so many movements in there. Your one-time changes, your pirouettes, your zigzags and an extended canter and there's just a basic mark for the collected canter in the Grand Prix. So many points to be won there. Let's move away from horses for one quick question. What's your perfect Saturday night look like? Uh, well, it depends what time of year that is, doesn't it? I mean, my Saturday night in the summer is sitting in the garden uh, and just sitting around the table with friends and eating and drinking all night long. At this time of year, it's lighting the fire and watching all of my favorite programs on a Saturday night. Also with friends, I mean, Saturday night is always the night. I mean, this year, for the first time, I would say, Sundays have become Sundays. Uh, I think for most of us that uh, are com competition riders, you know, the one week just blends into another. You don't have days off because we're competing at weekends or we're traveling away or, you know, very busy generally. So this year, uh, Sundays have returned to being a family Sunday for me. You know, I actually have had a day off on a Sunday. Uh, which means I can get as wrecked as I like on a Saturday night because for once I can lie in on a Sunday and enjoy remembering what a hangover was all, all about. And, and what would those box sets be that you watch on telly? I know you're a bit of a reality TV fan, sort of X Factor and that sort of thing. Well, yes, I love, yeah, no, I love, I, I am um, sadly a reality TV person. Um, you know, I don't have time to watch telly particularly very much. I have loved, as I know a lot of people have, The Crown. You know, I couldn't believe it was such a well-made program, whether it's uh, very fictional or not. I've enjoyed it, I've loved that. So that's something I would definitely put on on a Saturday night. Um, and then somebody's been sort of, she did, I wanted to keep all her words in because I thought it was important. Being the legend that you are and someone who is, everyone aspires to have lessons with, and it's hard to improve on perfection, but there's always room for imp improvement. Who do you go for for lessons? Obviously Charlotte helps you, but is there someone else as your go-to person? Um, thank you very much for being so kind, first of all. That's very sweet. Um, I do... Yes, I mean, I ha obviously Charlotte and I work together, so that's my eyes on the ground every day. Uh, we're very different personalities, uh, as anybody that knows us would know that. I, I have to calm her down, she uh, likes to wind me up for the competitions, uh, and that works quite well. Um, but I have a, a friend in Holland, uh, Anna van Olst, who in fact, of course, now is Lottie Fry's sponsor, owner. Um, well, Anna and I did our first Olympics together. Um, she happens to have also ridden five Olympics. And um, we've trained together on and off over the years. And uh, Anna will ring me when she has a problem with a horse. I ring her when I have a problem. And um, yeah, we just talk about it. And I mean, if I go and stay with her, I mean, literally, she gets out the wine, she lights the candles, we sit down. And <laughs> very boring for some people, but she talks dressage. And, you know, I've learned so much 
um, from her and about breeding and about training and about riding. So I still, you know, Anna and I would still speak now. She doesn't compete sadly anymore. And um, I think she's looking forward to the day that I stop competing so that we can um, enjoy these talks a little bit more. Never going to happen. Not, I'm just in denial about that, but that's fine. Um, if you could have taken another career path, what do you think it might have been? Well, I'd have worked in the hotel trade. Um, you know, I was very busy in tourism uh, on and off through my teenage years. And I started working in a hotel when I was 13. Sounds like slave labor, but my parents were definitely in the summer holidays. You have to have a job. You're not, you don't have a holiday. So I started working in, uh, in the hotel, just in pot wash and plate wash. Um, but I loved it. I loved the buzz of a hotel. I loved the atmosphere of working in one. I liked the evenings and the buzz of it and chefs going mad and all that sort of thing. I wouldn't have wanted to end up in the kitchen. I w certainly would have wanted to end up at the front of the house. Um, and, uh, you know, I worked in the bar there in the hotel as well in the evenings. Um, and in those days, of course, everyone, you know, you didn't get tips. Everyone bought you a drink. So. It was a great <laughs> job. I mean, anybody who wonders why I like my wine now, well, I, I mean, it was like petrol in those days when we were working in, um, working in that industry. Um, this one's probably the most difficult question of the lot, but I thought I'd throw it in, so please don't, don't hate me for it. But is there a small part of you that wishes you'd have kept the ride on Vallegro? No. I mean, that's a simple answer. And I mean, it is a question that I've been asked, obviously, all the way through, especially at the time of the Olympics. Um, I think... You know, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, that was so kind of you, but to let Charlotte ride in, but I enjoyed it. It wasn't kind of me. I mean, she did it. She was doing a great job. And um, I had Utopia at the same time. I knew that really there was, it was pointless me keeping both the horses because they were both brilliant. And if I could get Charlotte going on Vallegro and I had Utopia, and of course we had Laura and Horace at the same time, that um, then we had a gold medal team. So it was, it, was, it was an easy decision. She wouldn't have let me take him back anyway, whether I wanted to ride him or not. She was so attached to him by the time we got to that level, because of course, that's a big journey coming from the bottom to the top with your horse. Um, and I don't think she'd have ever let that happen. And I enjoyed every single minute of it. And I think, you know, looking back over my career, that's pr that probably gives me more pleasure to have seen those two together and the thing and the places we went to around the world and the things she won and did. Um, you know, that has to be the highlight of my career over my own competitive one, really. Brilliant. Um, just a topical one. What are your thoughts on the new short Grand Prix? Um, well, I had a chance to ride it. Um, it was, as we know, it was just a, a pilot at the time. So I hadn't really got stuck into training for it because I thought this will be a one-off. So, um, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I don't enjoy it as much as the Grand Prix. And at the end of the day, I do dressage because I enjoy the training and I enjoy all the movements and the difficulty in it. And I like to do everything that's in it. You know, to me, that shows, um, you know, how, how well trained your horse is um, as a whole. But, and, you know, we also have to appreciate at the moment, you know, how venues are going to fill up, how all show organisers need to sell it to the public. Um, you know, the real dressage will never go away. We're always going to have our European World and Olympics. Uh, I'm sure we'll keep as much of the classical side to that in the competition. But I think for these World Cups, they're very different and it is all about the music. So, you know, when I see proof that it actually works, then, you know, I would obviously be behind it. Um, here's a sort of uh, looking back or, or forward, I suppose. What horses that are former or currently competing would you love to have a ride on? I have it. And that is Vogue. On Vogue. I mean, you know, he is... I've always loved watching him. I've always thought, you know, because obviously uh, I've sat on him over the years if Charlotte's been away or something, and I've always thought, oh, this is just my sort of horse. Uh, and here I am now uh, riding him full time. Uh, I've done a few Grand Prix this year. Um, it's really interesting when you, you know, you have a horse that you know is special, really interesting, then um, what happens is you have to, well, I just feel that the whole time, whatever happens, whatever he does, whether I've made mistakes or not, I always still come out smiling. That's quite unusual. Sometimes you come out, you know, you feel like, oh, the horse didn't try hard enough or I made a mistake or we didn't gel. Um, but he gives me such an amazing feeling. I, I mean, even, you know, like if I missed... Mr. Change or something, I still, you know, like have a great big toothy grin at the end of the diagonal because I just thought, oh, well, the, the bits he did do felt amazing. So, I have to say, uh, watch have it, watching Charlotte ride him as a youngster, 
he probably would have been the last horse I would have ever dreamt you'd have got on and enjoyed. <laughs> I do agree with that. I mean, he wasn't... But don't forget, in those days as well, you know, Charlotte and I both liked hot horses. We both liked quirky horses. Um, and he definitely was that. And, you know, so for me personally, I absolutely loved it, you know. I mean, I feel safe on him. He's still... I mean, I rode him this morning, and it's very funny. He's very cold-backed. And he's 11 years old. Um, and... Basically, you know, I got on him and he stopped dead and he put his back up and I was like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And then I would go a few more times and he stopped again and Charlotte was like, what are you doing? And I said, this is not the moment to give a horse like this a quick kick forward because I will come off him. So he still has that about him, but he's the kindest horse in the world. It's, it's not meant uh, certainly in a nasty way. I think that's a lovely, I was expecting some sort of reminiscing of horses from the 80s, but I, I love that, that you've, the horse that you've got now. I think that's great. Um, when you do eventually hang your, hang your boots up and we all go into mourning, have you considered being a judge or maybe a, a team selector? <laughs> judge, not. Um, definitely not. That's not for me. Uh, I think they have a very hard time. Selector, possibly, but I mean, you know, I, I want to be behind the training side of it. I mean, that's where my passion is now. And um, I mean, a, a, anyone can see, well, I can't even train the dogs, <laughs> but I mean, at least I think I can train. Um, a dressage horse and a rider so that's my that's my passion and that's what I hopefully will just just continue doing it'll just become um, an extension of what it is already um, we enjoyed a Carl at 50 not so long ago somebody's asked what do you envisage Carl at 70 looking like what will your life be in 20 years time or just over just under 20 years time well more weathered obviously I mean you know we're always outside with the horses um, 70 I mean I don't know I mean Hopefully I can still ride, um, you know, even if I'm not competing. I mean, that isn't my passion, but I mean, I should still be riding at home and hopefully finding other riders that, um, you know, can help bring on and help produce horses with. And, um, you know, like I do, I love my traveling as well. So a little bit more time in the sun, maybe. So um, I might be looking a little bit brown and leathery by 70, I would imagine. But, you know, uh, you know, training, but still training. Um, and then finally, just one sort of to end with in the Christmas spirit. What does Christmas Day look for, look like for you? And would you consider yourself sort of a Kris Kringle, happy-go-lucky Christmas kind of guy, or are you the Grinch? Love Christmas. I love Christmas. Um, it will be, I mean, well, as I explained at the beginning of this little lovely interview, Sundays are Sundays, and Christmas Day will be a Sunday. Uh, you know, I enjoy coming out here, um, you know, maybe taking uh, Vallegro for a ride. The dogs. Exercising the dogs because they obviously need it, um, and yeah, and then we just have a lovely lunch. I mean, obviously this year it's going to be a different lunch. We normally have a big, big group here. Um, this might be get out to a new life for Christmas. I don't know, but it's it's a lovely time of year, and I love it. And um, yeah, just while I'm, while I'm here, wish everyone a very happy Christmas. Well, thank you, Carl. We look forward to seeing you at Hartbury in a few weeks' time um, with Vogue to do yeah, the Lemur Grand Prix Championships. Um, but thank you for giving up some of your time for us, for all the members to watch these videos that we've been putting together. It's much appreciated. That's a pleasure. Thank you.